Welcome to the HDR Digital Asset Group podcast series, where we interview thought leaders in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space. Today, we are very excited to have Song Ding, principal at Comcast Ventures, talk about the impact of ICOs and blockchain crypto startups. So Song, can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into the VC space and became a principal at such an early age? Sure. So um, I started off my career, as many do, by going into uh, work at an investment bank. Um, I did a few different roles at Morgan Stanley. You know, I started off actually as a foreign exchange derivatives trader before moving into um, a capital markets role where I cover financial institutions, including Morgan Stanley. Um, you know, those three years that I spent at Morgan Stanley were very formative, but it also helped me realize that you know, I wanted to do a job that was more strategic and allowed me to kind of engage more directly with, um, you know, various stakeholders in a more meaningful, operationally intensive way. And so from that, I ended up uh, moving out to the West Coast and um, finding a really exciting role at Yahoo on the corporate development team. Um, that was really my introduction to Silicon Valley and all the technology and, and fascinating things happening in the Valley. Um, you know, one of my first experiences on the job was trying to figure out if Yahoo should um, acquire a consumer app um, from another um, prominent company and what it meant for all the users and all the, you know, technology integration. So from someone who had gone, you know, from looking at Morgan Stanley balance sheets all day to um, all of a sudden looking at, you know, consumer MAUs and DAUs, um, it was an interesting shift and transition. Um, And, you know, after spending some time at Yahoo, when the company kicked off its sale process, one of my team members was, you know, kind enough to recommend that, you know, I explore early stage venture. He had seen that I had shown a lot of interest in, um, you know, emerging technologies and thought that I should definitely think about venture. And I never really considered venture capital before because it was a very uh, murky field. And I, you know, felt like there wasn't a lot of resources or information available about how to even break in and, and how to make that transition. Um, so it started having some conversations and ended up finding a really good fit and role at Comcast Ventures. And I would say uh, what's been super exciting for me is coming from having worked at a large investment bank and seen uh, traditional financial services and then also seen um, you know, how a large mature tech company operates and tries to innovate. Um, for me, being in a corporate venture role is, is really the most exciting and interesting way to apply those experiences. So at CV, I you know work on financially oriented, early stage consumer and emerging tech investments. But I also have an opportunity to learn and, and draw on the wisdom and resources and assets available across Comcast NBC Universal and use that information and, and expertise to help me become a better investor, but also find opportunities that could you know, be introduced back into the Comcast platform. Thank you for sharing that song. Um, beyond just financial services, there's been a lot of talk about blockchain being disruptive to the digital media internet vertical. So we're definitely very excited to get your opinion um, here. Last year, yeah. more money was raised via ICOs than early stage venture capital across all types of startups. You know, how has the creation of ICOs impacted the VC industry? Um, Great question. I think we are still all figuring it out. Um, From a pure structural perspective, I think it's really challenged, um, you know, all of our investors as well as lawyers and and legal teams to have to roll up our sleeves and and do a lot of, you know, reinvention of, you know, what does it look like in a fund mandate to all of a sudden have, you know, this new asset class with new new structures and and new market dynamics. You know, it's a very different um, type of security, very different risk profile, liquidity profile, you know, something as simple as how do you mark to market? Or are you actually holding, you know, liquid um, assets? Are you holding, um, you know, non-liquid assets? A lot of funds, you know, typically are not structured to to handle and and be able to, um, you know, be active investors in in new uh, forms of, of securities. And so you've seen a lot of funds, you know, adjusting their mandates or coming up with the right legal and back end structures to be able to be active. Um, but even, you know, taking a step, that's kind of like the, the nuanced um, details about how, how some VCs are thinking about it. But even taking a step back, you know, the fundamental democratization of financing opportunities has really changed the dynamic and proposition of a traditional VC to entrepreneur, right? Previously, it's 
you have an individual who's the investor that holds access to this pool of capital. And based on a, on a um, series of evaluations, especially at the early stage, a lot of it just based on the entrepreneur, you know, in, in exchange of, of, you know, capital market agreements get, gets made. Um, now that there's this, you know, opportunity for any entrepreneur, or any company to think about ICO as a route of financing, that really kind of changes the need and the value proposition of that, you know, historically traditional venture capitalist. Um, and so I would say, too, like if you look at what Comcast Ventures has done, we've taken very much a crawl, walk, run strategy when it comes to learning about um, blockchain investments and, and crypto investments. And so initially, we started off by partnering with a fund um, and making you know, um, our, I guess, like crawl investment into a fund. Um, then, you know, we started as we kind of got up to speed and started learning about the space, we moved to walk, which was, you know, starting to think about selective investments in blockchain related technologies or startups that were incorporating blockchain technology into their business model. But ultimately, you know, once you move into the run category, you should be agile and nimble across all the various uh, liquidity stages of blockchain and crypto. And I think that's, you know, ultimately where we're headed. Um, and then I would say the last thing, too, is, you know, this is all still being fully fleshed out. I think, um, you know, everyone from traditional VCs to um, non-traditional investors, you know, even you see um, some startups themselves um, amending their own charter documents to include a provision to be able to participate in ICOs. And so I think it totally does change that um, relationship between a traditional investor and a traditional you know, entrepreneur and makes um, everyone able to kind of participate in that process. And there's a lot to be said from a guidance and management operations perspective that VCs um, and growth equity firms could provide some of these you know, startups in the blockchain crypto space. So it'd be good down the line to see some type of partnership form as well. That would be something that would help them succeed down the line. Yeah, so like, you know, we are um, we are really fortunate that one of our portfolio companies we've been super excited about, um, who now um, ended up deciding to go the ICO route. And so it, it was a fascinating experience because we got to see, you know, you now was a non blockchain non crypto investment in the past, right? It was a uh, um, just a standalone early stage, you know, media uh, related uh, investment that we had. And then we kind of saw how for that type of company to think about potentially, you know, issuing um, what they call props and, um, you know, incorporating blockchain technology into their platform, you know, how that evolution kind of took place. And then, you know, we were happy to, to support um, in any way we could as existing investors. And so I think that's what's really fascinating about what's happening right now is you have such a spectrum, you know, of different companies. And, you know, I see everyone from, um, let's, let me think of like a crazy example, you know, a esports company that's uh, integrating a blockchain component to, um, I just saw recently a, uh, a, uh, a company that wants to do direct-to-consumer um, soccer league video content, like a Netflix for sports, um, that, was, that had like a, a blockchain component to it as well, you know, all the way to, um, you know, more traditional, um, you know, enterprise applications as well. So, um, you know, I think that's really exciting and there's this really dynamic spectrum of companies doing interesting things in the space. The flip side to that, though, is the question I always ask entrepreneurs and, and you know, a question that we always think about when we deliberate internally is, does this company need crypto or is it, you know, the flavor of the week, right? And I think that um, will really be telling in terms of staying power and actual longevity of businesses. Are you tacking on, um, you know, a blockchain component just to kind of be the hot thing that's happening in the valley to get people's attention and, and to try to, um, you know, spruce up a more traditional business model or monetization model? Or is your business fundamentally going to change and be accelerated and supercharged by the introduction of this new type of technology? So uh, that kind of leads to my next question. Which industries do you think will be the first to effectively adopt blockchain technology on a notable scale? Seen a lot of use cases in financial services, obviously, but mm -hmm. beyond just that, um, and I mentioned digital media internet earlier, but from what you've seen, um, where are most of these blockchain crypto companies drawing their attention to? Yeah, you know, I, I would maybe, um, my personal focus for the past year or so has been on looking at the media applications. And so, 
you know, rewinding back, um, you know, even a year or two before um, things really got, you know, super crazy and mainstream is I think my initial focus as a VC was not necessarily on, I want to find a way to invest in media that has a blockchain angle. It was more that, you know, from very early on, I'd focus on this kind of pain point and problem of micro, like making micro payments work um, and thinking about media distribution and rights management. And that, I think that initial focus started without having to think about blockchain. You know, there's this issue of, you know, debundling of content, right? Millennials and, and consumers don't necessarily want, you know, content bundles in the same ways that, you know, that traditionally worked. And is there a way for someone to transact on a micro basis, right? Whether that's you watch one video and therefore you pay X amount for that one video um, or even, you know, like one song, right? Like think about what iTunes did for, for music. So I was very focused on micropayments. I was looking at it from a journalist, uh, journalism perspective, a video perspective. Then you have this other angle of creators and artists are not getting appropriately compensated and there's no clear way to track uh, value addition to a very complex creation process and to ultimately attribute, you know, value that comes down the chain, right? So, you know, some of the statistics around how much somebody who plays a meaningful role in creating a piece of content, how they get compensated down the line is actually very, very broken. And you have all these, you know, uh, middlemen and, and people who come in and kind of disrupt that, take, you know, value off the top. Um, so I was, I was looking at that. And then I was also looking um, as, you know, a third piece of it um, on reward systems as well. How do you uh, create an opportunity for um, a company like Comcast, right? Like if you watch a Universal Studios movie, like Pacific Rim, and then, you know, later on you book a trip to Harry Potter World, and then you, you know, become a, you upgrade your cable and internet service. Like those are all touch points that you're having with the Comcast NBCU platform, but currently there's no um, overall reward system to link all those pieces together. Um, so that was something else. And then Sorry, I'm like, I'm go jumping from place to place, but the, the last piece that I was also very interested in is in this idea of assigning value to social interactions. So if you are um, the originator of a piece of, you know, whether it's visual or verbal, or, you know, even if you create a meme and the meme um, gains virality, is there a way for you to monetize or capture the value that you just created into this ecosystem? So anyway, I was kind of very focused on, on these topics of, Assigning, you know, micro value to creation. Um, how do you track the value that you create in communities and ecosystems? And so naturally, I, you know, started thinking about how blockchain could could be applied to some of these use cases. Um, and so I think um, there are a lot of really fascinating entrepreneurs working in the space. If media has, you know, not necessarily been as hot as like financial services um, when when people talk about blockchain and crypto. Um, but what I think is super interesting is it's bringing really non-traditional entrepreneurs who've been, um, you know, artists or creators or in the media business to, you know, think about using blockchain as a way to, you know, disrupt and create a better solution for their respective industries. So those are all things that I, you know, th all those specific use cases I described are companies that I've met with, right? You know, there's um, a lot of companies tackling each of those individual kind of pain points, you know, reward systems, unified reward systems. Um, uh, social um, and, and media kind of um, uh, building um, uh, social value and, and extracting social value. And then also um, on um, even, uh, you know, just pure rights management and, and micropayments too. So those are all like actually specific business that I've looked at. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, they were all a little bit too early and the business models were not fully fleshed out. But those are some of the things that I've been thinking about. And it really starts with identifying a non-blockchain problem in media, and then really thinking smartly about how blockchain could be applied by, you know, extraordinary entrepreneurs to solve some of these problems. And then, you know, down the road, you can totally see how if one of these businesses takes off, it could be very interesting to Comcast and BCU from a strategic perspective as well. Yeah, and that's definitely right. I think in a recent year since the internet the media and data out there from media companies has just been prolific because of all the intermediaries in between, even from an advertising perspective, that entire space has a lot of middlemen and could um, do with more of a blockchain crypto type of technology where you can track advertisements and ensure that the people are watching it and are getting compensated for their time. So yeah, so definitely 
yeah. feels like a very exciting space to be in for sure. Yeah. And like, you know, one of the, um, you know, I, I guess this company has now recently been um, exited, um, but it, it's really interesting to think about even how it impacted me in my daily role. So um, 21, or I guess they changed their name to Earn, um, but I'm on Earn and I still to this day get emails from entrepreneurs. And if I reply to those emails, I get a monetary value. Um, it's kind of crazy, right? But the whole idea is, you know, to reach me and to kind of um, have me respond to a pitch or an inbound email, like, is that worth something? And, you know, it can be worth, you know, as much as like, I think $20 or $5 or $10. You know, I made it $1 just because I think, um, you know, more for like test cases versus I actually want to monetize my email responses. But it's just super interesting to see what it feels like when, you know, I get so much, you know, inbound email, but then if I get one from that platform, and it says, you know, XYZ entrepreneur wants to connect with you. If you respond, you get a dollar. It's just a very interesting um, proposition that, um, you know, uh, definitely changes how I think about, um, you know, my time and, and the act of responding to an email. So it definitely sounds like blockchain crypto technology has more of an immediate impact on Comcast Ventures. And in an interview you gave last year, you dubbed Comcast Ventures as sort of the Lewis and Clark for the rest of the company. And mentioned mm-hmm. that many of the investments that you look at, such as VR, AI, autonomous mobility, might not have had immediate strategic relationship with Comcast. So kind of given that context, where does blockchain crypto companies fall on that spectrum? You've already mentioned some use cases of actual companies you've talked to. Are there any blockchain crypto companies that you could see more of a near-term relationship with from a Comcast yeah. perspective? Definitely. I think um, the rewards rewards application was something that we've been um, thinking about. But I, I think even at a higher level, what's been super great is like, you know, a year and a half ago when um, or even, you know, five years ago. Right. Like when I was a foreign exchange trader, a lot of those guys are, are people that ended up uh, becoming you know major thought leaders in the cryptocurrency space. Um, you know, it, it seemed like the tie between someone like a traditional corporate like Comcast and you know, this new type of technology was a little bit more distant. But now, you know, we've got an internal um, uh, working group with, with engineers and, and strategists from across the company who are thinking about applications for blockchain. And so that's like super exciting for me. And, and I would say that has been a similar um, playbook that's, that's happened, you know, whether it's in VR, AR or um, AI, where, you know, we might be seeing things first and, and connecting with entrepreneurs first just because of where we physically and also where we physically are located and also our mandate within the company. Um, but, you know, in, in a very short amount of time, very smart people who are experts in their respective fields at Comcast and NBCU have now, you know, kind of found each other and formed a coalition and are actively thinking and evaluating opportunities. And so now if I were to, you know, if Comcast Ventures were to see a, um, a blockchain related company that's doing something that's potentially relevant or interesting for NBCU as well. We've got this kind of full bench to diligence, to evaluate, to assess, and, you know, whether or not there are, you know, pilot or exploratory commercial opportunities, that's always, you know, to be determined and never guaranteed. But now we've kind of got both sides. And so, um, you know, I, I love the Lewis and Clark example, but I also kind of think of it as venture capital plus. Right. Like if you're an early stage company in the space, you can go and pitch, you know, traditional um, investors and, you know, they can offer you advice. They could offer you a network. They could offer you some capital. Um, but if you're building something really exciting in the blockchain space, that might be um, an enterprise application or it might be a media application, you know, or even a security application. Like when you talk to Comcast Ventures now, you're not only talking to the investment arm and, and the, the um, VCs that have been looking at the space and studying the space, but you're also potentially, you know, touching point with um, the leaders in cybersecurity at Comcast or, you know, the people that run the media distribution uh, and, and uh, kind of content uh, distribution folks, the advertising folks. And so um, it, it's a really deep bench and, and it's a really interesting kind of venture capital plus model. The partnership ecosystem will definitely be important for some of these blockchain crypto companies to get their foot off the ground and really be able to scale and gain adoption. And so given what we just discussed with related to blockchain crypto and sort of your focus on emerging technology, what do you predict will be some of the trends for the media entertainment industry or for the media industry down the line? If you could 
think about in 10 years, like what is music distribution going to look like? What is advertising going to look like? What would you say, given everything you know about some of these emerging technologies? Um, that's a great question. I would say my my instinct and my gut feeling is that um, consumers crave a direct connection to the source of their media and content, right? You see that happening in a lot of the UGC platforms like YouTube. Um, you see that happening with the success of Netflix, where um, the traditional value chain of media creation and distribution is being uh, condensed. And, um, you know, like not to not to use this is a, like a ridiculous example, but, you know, Taylor Swift just launched a music video on Spotify and, you know, Spotify is moving into video content and the format of her video was very different than the traditional video she releases. It was a vertical video, one shot taken, you know, as if she was um, kind of shooting off of her, her own iPhone. And that was the first piece of video content, vertical video, like, like uh, Snapchat and one take that Spotify chose to push. And so you, you kind of see um, some of these distributors, right? And, and what is Spotify? Spotify is, is like the Netflix model, subscription, debundle, direct to, um, direct to consumer, um, you know, media. And so I think, you know, you see some of these changes happening and, and that to me instinctively makes sense. I think where I struggle is do consume, like how do consumers value their time, right? Like, and we think about this a ton. Like we think about, you know, even with related to, the Facebook hack, right? Like, what is the value of data to a consumer? And does, you know, does the next generation, you know, Gen Z, think about their personal data and their, you know, the data extracted from what they view and how they engage with with um, with digital uh, experiences as something that has value, or is that like table stakes for for being um, given access to a platform? And so that's the piece where I. I have to kind of think about a little bit further and flesh out because, you know, if you believe that this relationship between a user and the source of content or the source of uh, service becomes more uh, collapsed and the value chain becomes, you know, more direct, then the next question is, well, how valuable is that? Like, what does the, um, what does the, you know, kind of economic relationship then look like? And then I think that's where I, you know, kind of run into this, um, philosophical dilemma of like what is the value of um, receiving a piece of content or engaging with a piece of content and, and um, you know reading an article like there's been some interesting models that haven't worked out to be frank where um, entrepreneurs have tried to bring together um, a triangle effect where like if you're a user you want to access a piece of content instead of paying for that content you will then um, complete like a survey from an advertiser. And so it's almost by like, you know, giving 30 seconds to a minute of your time or, or however long it is to complete this um, survey, which, you know, is a value to the advertiser or the brand, you then gain access to content. But like that three-way marketplace model just has not traditionally worked out. Um, so I, I guess coming back to your question of, you know, what do I predict? I predict that some, if, if an entrepreneur can come up with a way um, to clearly define the value proposition to a user and have that exchange of, you know, attention or data or personal um, engagement and exchange for a media experience. Like whoever kind of figures that value proposition out in a clear and, and defined way, I think that is like super interesting, and exciting to me. And you see, you know, the analog I would point to is ad blocking, right? Ad blocking has kind of become this thing, and then then there's like ad blocker blockers an ad blocker, blocker, blockers, probably. And like that, you know, this like race to, to nowhere. Um, but I, I think that's like a really interesting analog where it was a very clear value proposition to um, to users. And ultimately, you know, you will opt to not to switch off your ad blocker and, and to uh, receive ads for a specific piece of content. So, you know, those are kind of some of the things that I, I think are super exciting in this space. And I think, you know, like I said earlier, Blockchain doesn't necessarily need to play in a role in it, but if it does in a um, kind of efficient and more supercharged way, then, you know, that's super interesting to me. You brought up a couple of good points there. Um, just this whole idea of the value of data, the value of privacy, the value of time. If there are companies out there selling and making money off of their data, consumers should be able to monetize themselves from their own data. And I think you're beginning to see a lot of companies trying to play with that idea 
And I think blockchain and crypto companies will play a role in somehow being able to track that at a micro level. So, you know, what you mentioned with the email and being able to get compensated for your time of, you know, responding to either a survey or responding to an email, you're going to see more and more of that um, with the media space as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you think about Netflix, it's like everyone, you know, knows how much of a, a data factory Netflix is, right? And people are seem to be fine with that exchange, right? Because it's like, hey, like, you know, you can... Um, totally get my viewing behavior and you can um, understand what type of content I like and how I like to view it. Um, in an exchange, you give me like a better and better content experience, right? From the actual content that Netflix is now making to, you know, how I like to watch it, you know, binge watching, how I, um, you know, like what, what behavior is I exhibit and, and use that to make better content. I think that's the implicit value proposition and people seem to be okay with that. But then you look at what happened with Facebook and the data hack. And I think, you know, the people are very uncomfortable with that. And so I think that that's the piece that I think really needs to evolve and be defined, which is, you know, what is the value of attention? What's an appropriate amount of kind of gray insights that are being extracted? And what is it being used for? I think the use, um, the use of it is really important. If it's being used to create a better experience, um, then that's okay. But then you run into the whole issue of like, what is better? Um, and you get into, you know, the Facebook problems that they're having. Yeah. And I think these problems that are being surfaced now by Facebook is going to only become more and more apparent in the next couple of years. Because I think for our generation, millennials, we sort of accepted that as a, our baseline. You know, businesses can do whatever they want with our data. It could probably contribute to their bottom line. And we're in no way being compensated for that. But I think you're going to see Generation Z ask more and more questions because they're seeing these type of headlines coming up. And they're saying, well, you know, if so-and-so is selling my consumer data to this other company and making money off of that, I should in some way demand some form of payment. So, yeah. So I think yeah. that, that'll definitely be an interesting trend to see play out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, I, I think it's really interesting. So, Song, that's all we have time for. Thank you for taking the time. We just learned so much about cryptocurrency specifically for media. And I think being able to get your perspective on all the cool things that you've seen will really help our community learn about blockchain and crypto startups beyond just payments and what you, you're seeing prevalent today. Yeah. And I, and I would kind of caveat, like I only look at um, you know very small sliver of this like fascinating ecosystem and you know, for me, it's, I, I really think it's important not to necessarily set out to speak blockchain, as like, uh, or at least for me, as like a baseline investment criteria. Often it's what are the interesting applications and, you know, very clever and strategic and thoughtful ways to incorporate this tool effectively into uh, building a um, big and exciting and lasting business that will disrupt an industry. Um, you know, others on my team are approaching it very differently if they're looking at, you know, more, um, you know, enterprise or core applications. But, you know, for me, looking at, you know, consumer, consumer businesses, um, you know, that's kind of how I approach it.